Adventure series back after the long hiatus um, online. Uh, there are still some videos on our YouTube channel if you are interested in watching some of the previous presentations that are part of this series from the last two years. They're on the uh, Saskatoon Public Library's YouTube channel. My name is Megan. I'm one of the programming librarians here. I'm really glad to welcome you all back. Uh, I have made uh, some coffee. It is not decaffeinated, so I will probably be the only one drinking it, and it's already hitting me pretty hard. Um, and then there's tea and some cookies if you want to help yourself afterwards. Uh, we'll do the presentation, and then there'll be a Q&A session following that. And this, face, this presentation is uh, being streamed on Facebook, and we'll record that stream, uh, that live stream from Facebook, and post it on the YouTube as well. So if there's anybody who couldn't make it out tonight and wants to see it, it will be available later. Uh, there's some washrooms just out in the hallway. Um, and I'd like once more to welcome everybody before I hand it over. The Saskatoon Public Library um, is built and operates on land that traditionally belongs to the Métis people and the indigenous people of Saskatchewan. And we're very grateful to them for sharing their experiences and uh, their place here with us. Um, all right, I think I'm going to invite up Margaret, and she'll share some info about the Saskatchewan Environmental Society. Hi, my name is Margaret Asmus, some information about the Saskatchewan Environmental Society to mark our new venture into in-person presentations. Uh, as you probably know, uh, this speaker series is a collaboration between the Saskatoon Public Library and the Saskatchewan Environmental Society. Um, the SES, or the Saskatchewan Environmental Society, has been working on environmental issues in Saskatchewan since 1970, so that's more than 50 years. Um, and at that time, there was no Ministry of Environment, no Environment in Canada, uh, so it was uh, in a lot of ways really ahead of its time. It began as the Saskatoon Environmental Society. Uh, volunteers focused on preserving the riverbank, and that work eventually led to the Uwasa Valley Authority, uh, who we're all very aware of. Uh, when it became clear that there were more issues, more environmental issues to be addressed, just the riverbank, uh, the Saskatoon Environmental Society became the Saskatoon, the Saskatchewan Environmental Society, excuse me. Uh, the Saskatchewan Environmental Society is a charity with members from all over the province now. It's not just Saskatoon based, in fact, we even have some members from outside of the province. Um, our mission, or our mandate, is to work towards a world in which all needs can be met sustainably. And we do this by working on a broad range of issues, including uh, sustainable agriculture and forestry, energy issues, water and habitat protection, and climate change, among others. Uh, we do this work, we do the work on, on these issues by evaluating policy, advocating and promoting uh, best practice, providing expertise, and engaging and educating citizens through our program. Um, in general, SES has developed a reputation for sound science, good management, civility, and a willingness to collaborate. We welcome you to this evening, the first in person, as we've said uh, in a while. And uh, we, uh, we certainly thank the volunteers who, who work so ably on putting the program together. Um, I, if you want more information on the Saskatchewan Environmental Society, just Google Saskatchewan Environmental Society and it'll come to our website. Um, and I will also be around uh, for the presentation afterwards, as will our executive director who's sitting over there. So if you want to talk to one of us about the sort of things 
job, and I am a volunteer with the Saskatchewan Environmental Society, and in that capacity, I help organize the Sustainability Speaker Series. This evening, um, Bill Hale and Tyler Krause will share their experiences with electric vehicles in Saskatchewan. Bill Hale has a degree in mechanical engineering from the University of Waterloo and an MBA that's a Master's of Business Administration from the University of Oxford. Since 2016, his focus has been on dealing with the challenge of climate change by encouraging shifts to alternatives to fossil fuels. For the past six years, he has sold solar power technology and electric vehicles. Bill has driven an electric vehicle for the past four years, summer and winter, <coughs> and understands very well the behaviors of EVs in our climate. He now works as a project manager in renewable energy and an EV charging uh, infrastructure. Our other speaker is Tyler Krauss. Tyler is a founder and president of the Tesla Owners Club of Saskatchewan. Tyler is a graduate of Walter Murray Collegiate and the University of Saskatchewan in Saskatchewan. He is a professional structural engineer and a videographer. Tyler has four years of experience in driving EVs in Saskatchewan. Both Bill and Tyler are on the board of SASC EV. The title of their presentation is The Electric Vehicle in Saskatchewan. All right, thank you, Carol. Okay, so yeah, me and Bill are uh, here today to, to chat with you guys about uh, our experience uh, with electric vehicles. Uh, both myself and Bill have had our cars for a few years now, and, and we've been through a few winters. We've driven them all throughout Saskatchewan and, and North America, um, and uh, I think we have some interesting information for you guys today. Um, so uh, my name is Tyler Krause. Uh, I purchased a Model 3, uh, which is a fully battery electric vehicle in 2018. Uh, just around that time, I also started the Tesla Owners Club of Saskatchewan, uh, our nonprofit uh, owners club that we put on various events throughout Saskatchewan. Um, I've driven approximately 90,000 kilometers uh, using exclusively electricity. I've saved about $12,000 in fuel, depending on how you calculate it, depending on what the cost of fuel is that day. Um, and that uh, equates to about $2,300 in electricity use. I'm Bill Hale. And uh, I purchased my first EV four years ago. It was a 2015 uh, Fiat 500e, and uh, it's a it's a tiny little car, but it was uh, it was a great little vehicle for um, shopping trips and uh, and commuting around the uh, the city. Um, but I outgrew that, and, uh, and so earlier this year I bought a, uh, a 2022 um, uh, Tesla Model 3 long range, uh, and I'm part of the board. Of SASC EV, as Tyler mentioned. I put about 45,000 kilometers on uh, electric vehicles uh, since then, and uh, saved about $7,200 in fuel, and that has cost me about $1,400 in, uh, in electricity. And uh, I never went back. <laughs> so um, we'll just kind of go through uh, just a general outline of what we're going to talk about today. So we're going to start with the kind of a general history of electric vehicles. Uh, we're going to talk about the different types of electric vehicles. Uh, we're going to talk about how they work and specifically how they work in Saskatchewan and in our climate. Uh, we're going to talk about the environmental impact uh, of electric vehicles, uh, which is very important. Uh, and we're also going to talk a little bit about the market and the, the community. Uh, so the electric vehicles have a number of uh, great features. Um, one of them is, is the driving experience. They're very quiet. There's uh, a, uh, you'll just be astounded by the acceleration from even a, a very minor um, or very inexpensive car. Um, and they're very safe to drive. They're uh, in a low center of gravity, so they handle very well. Um, the maintenance costs are uh, about 60%. So uh, we'll see a little bit more about the environmental uh, benefits uh, 
Yeah, and of course, you know, we want to be honest about EVs. There are some challenges, of course. Uh, often they have a higher upfront cost, approximately fifteen thousand dollars over an equivalent gas vehicle. Uh, there, you know, there, there was a lack of charging infrastructure, and in some areas there certainly still is, um, but it's way better. When I first got my car in twenty eighteen, uh, there were no fast chargers in Saskatchewan at all, and now there's, uh, you know, about, about a dozen or so. Uh, so things are improving, but we still have a bit of a ways to go, especially further north. Um, there is that decreased range in winter, of course, uh, they don't go quite as far, um, you know, but, but it's, it's still very practical. Um, so I just want to kind of start out here with a couple quick quotes. Um, so this is from uh, the CEO of VW, um, and they said, you know, our industry is going to change more deeply in the coming 10 years than the, in the 100 years before. And I think that's very true, uh, and we've already seen a lot of those changes in the last four years since, since I first did this presentation. Um, and of course, Elon Musk from Tesla, here's a great quote, we won't stop until every car on the road is electric. Um, and I think that's also, you know, very obvious. Um, so now we're just going to go through a brief history of the electric vehicles here. So in, in early days, the, the first electric vehicle uh, manufactured in the, in the U.S. was in 1890 by um, uh, William Morris, and uh, gives an image of it here. Um, then in 1901, there was a hybrid. Yeah, you know, and this is kind of where 2008, this is where things really started to, to develop a lot quicker. Um, Tesla started to experiment with, with their electric vehicles and they came out with the, the Tesla Roadster, um, which really started using some of the batteries that we see today. Um, and shortly after that, the Nissan Leaf came out. And this was uh, really a turning point because this was kind of arguably the first mass produced electric vehicle that came out. Um, today they sold about a half a million cars, I think it's actually quite a bit more than that now. Um, and shortly after that, the Chevy Volt uh, plug-in hybrid came out, uh, which again was, was one of the first mass-produced plug-in hybrid vehicles. Um, shortly after that, the, in 2012, the Model S came out from Tesla. Uh, again, this was another bit of a turning point because this was the first mass-produced, fully electric, uh, you know, full-size sedan. Um, and, and they've sold very well. It's also the quickest car ever in production. Uh, so it's faster than every Ferrari and Lamborghini ever made, uh, which is quite a milestone for electric vehicles. Um, the Tesla Semi was revealed in 2017. Uh, it's still not quite in production, but they should be building it in the Texas Gigafactory, which opened up uh, earlier this year. Um, and of course, in 2017, the Chevy Bolt came out, which was also a very important car. Um, they're still in production today, and, and they sold very well. It's, it's definitely one of the more affordable EVs uh, and, and also very capable. Uh, in 2017, the Model 3 came out, uh, which uh, is one of the best-selling EVs currently in production. Uh, that's what both myself and Bill have. Uh, in 2017, uh, the first electric truck, uh, well, it was announced, and it's, it was the first electric truck to actually come to the market. Uh, there's some in Canada already, and, and I've seen quite a few in the States. Um, and, of course, the Cybertruck, which uh, I, I was able to get a ride in when it came out in 2019, or when it was announced. Um, and this is important um, because in two days there was 200,000 reservations for this truck. Uh, we don't know the exact number of reservations today, but I expect it's well over a million. Um, so that kind of gives you a bit of an idea of kind of where we started and, and really how things are really accelerating today. Um, so we're just going to kind of talk about different types of electric vehicles. So um, the first is, is a hybrid electric vehicle, which has um, an electric motor and uh, gas engine, although the gas engine is a bit smaller, uh, but you can't plug it in. So essentially it gets better mileage uh, than, a, than just a, an electric vehicle, but all of the uh, charging of the um, uh, battery that drives the electric vehicle comes from the engine itself. And the next category is a plug-in hybrid electric vehicle. So this has a larger battery in it and, and a gas engine, but for um, range 
60, 70 kilometers, uh, it's, a, it's a reasonable commuting vehicle in the summer. And so you can plug this vehicle in and charge up the battery. So none of the uh, energy that is used to uh, move the vehicle uh, comes from fossil fuels, except perhaps what comes from, from the grid. Um, but for short range vehicles, this, uh, this, this is, you can drive it all electric, and then you have the, uh, the option of uh, gas or um, for the distance. And then of course, there's a fully electric, battery electric vehicle, and in this case, there's no other option but to, uh, to uh, plug it in at the capacity of the battery to turn itself right into it. So, um, I guess I've said a little bit about this already, but uh, I'll just quickly go through. So, the, the hybrid uh, electric vehicle has a small battery, there's modern maintenance, it always needs gas, there's no option to plug it in. It's the least efficient of these vehicles that we're going to talk about. And, and it also has the most environmental impact. Um, the Toyota Prius is an example, uh, and very pure one, as we've earlier said. A plug-in hybrid electric vehicle uh, has a small to medium-sized battery. Um, it has the most maintenance because um, there's more control involved in um, uh, the, the handoff between the electric and, uh, and gas uh, propulsion. Uh, it is only good for short trips, as we said. It does need gas in in winter and it is suitable for long trips. The electric range 20 to 75 kilometers. <coughs> the battery electric vehicle has the largest battery and has very low maintenance. It's completely dependent upon electricity um, and uh, has the most upfront cost, as Tyler alluded to, and least environmental impact, and those ranges uh, typically between 100 kilometers and 600. Okay, so um, now of course living in Saskatchewan, I mean, uh, it's, it's, our climate is more extreme, so uh, in a moment I'm going to get into kind of, you know, how it really works in Saskatchewan, but first I want to go over, you know, just the basic components for those of you that aren't really familiar with, with uh, what an electric car actually looks like and how it works. Um, and so here's kind of a diagram you can see, uh, you know, at the bottom here we have uh, the battery pack. It often takes up most of the bottom of the car, it's usually, you know, four or six inches thick. Um, and then usually there's a battery uh, either in the back or the front, uh, sorry, a motor in the back or the front, or sometimes also both, giving you the, the full four-wheel drive. Um, and then you can see these are just the high, high voltage lines uh, shown in, in yellow there. So it's, it, the drivetrain is very simple. Uh, you know, when you consider uh, what it would look like for a four-wheel drive uh, a combustion vehicle uh, with a transmission and, and uh, you know, a differential, etc., it, it's, it's much more simple. Um, this is a teardown of a Tesla Model S uh, that basically just shows the suspension, the drivetrain, the battery, and the motors. And you can see how, how very simple it is uh, compared to what we're used to in a gas car. Um, looking into the battery a little bit closer, so this is what most batteries look like nowadays. There are different types of batteries. Some of them can actually be lead acid, like what you'd see in a regular 12 volt battery. Some of them use what's called a pouch technology, so it looks like a bunch of you know, four inch by 10 inch pouches. Um, but this is kind of the most popular for a variety of reasons, uh, one of which is it, it can utilize a really efficient cooling method. And this is one of the really important things that I think people need to know about electric vehicles is that even though these batteries might be the exact same batteries that you might find on a laptop, uh, the cooling system, uh, it also functions as a heating system. So in, in winter, these batteries essentially heat themselves, which is why they, they can still perform in really, really low temperatures. Now, of course, because it's using the energy to do that, it can't go as far, uh, but those losses are, are you know, relatively minor. You can still go, uh, you know, I've, I've made trips multiple times to the mountains to go snowboarding and whatnot. So this is really an important slide, I think, to kind of visualize exactly what's in this pack. You can see these lines uh, here go between each set of batteries, and that's what provides that, that um, uh, cooling and heating, uh, of course. Um, and, and I think a lot of people always want to know, okay, well, how, how, how well does it work in winter? And I think the answer, uh, both, both me and Phil would say it works very well. Um, I mentioned earlier the batteries are temperature controlled, so they're always kept at a, a happy, healthy temperature. Uh, the heaters are, are often electric. Some of the newer models have a heat pump, uh, but they're very quick. Uh, you know, I, I always say that my, my car is like a stove, but as soon as you turn it on, the heat starts coming out of it. Uh, and it's, it's much quicker than a, than a gas vehicle. The traction control is very good because uh, the electric motors are able to modulate the power a lot quicker. 
In a gas car, you can use the ABS and it can try and apply the brakes and stuff, but it's not quite as sensitive and, uh, and um, accurate. Um, so there's a lot of people that will have a, a four-wheel drive Tesla, like a sedan, and it'll perform just as good as a, as a large SUV. Uh, they also are heavier, which helps with traction in certain situations as well. The biggest thing about winter driving is that the electric motors always work. Uh, unless there's some sort of manufacturing flaw, you know, or if the battery is dead, the vehicle will always start. Um, and I have a great video here uh, in a moment from one of the, the club members here. Uh, but before we get to that, I just want to show you a quick graph here. This is from uh, Dustin Barsh. He sent this to me. Uh, he gathered some data from his electric vehicle. And this kind of shows the efficiencies that he was getting in different temperatures. So you can see, you know, upwards of 15 to 20 degrees. He was getting, you know, well over 9% of the efficiency of that battery. So he was probably able to drive 450 to 500 kilometers. And as he got to a lower temperature, you can see minus 30 to minus 35, he was getting just under 50% efficiency. So maybe he's only able to travel, you know, 250 kilometers. Now, there's a lot of things that influence the efficiency uh, of, of a battery electric vehicle, not just the, the temperature. Uh, if it's windy, uh, if the roads are wet, or if there's a lot of snow on the roads, that can also decrease the, the range of the vehicle. My experience, and I think probably also Will would agree with this, is very rarely do you get into the situation where you know, you're, you're getting to that 50% loss. But it does happen. Um, so it's important to plan ahead and check the weather when making a trip uh, in an electric vehicle. Uh, the next slide here, we have a video uh, from one of our members. Uh, hopefully we can get the audio to work here. Okay, so. Just make sure we're connected. Uh, so this is Josh Baker. He made this video a few years ago and he owns a Tesla Model 3. He's gonna kind of give you a bit of a demo uh, on how it heats up and how it works. So hopefully the audio will work soon. 34 degrees Celsius uh, and dropping. It's supposed to go down to minus 39. I am in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. So we have a Tesla Model 3 and I'm going to do a little test. We're going to see how quick the car warms up from sitting there being cold and how quickly we can, we can drive away in it. We're going to time how long it takes to warm the car up. Just press that, climb and start. So it's sitting at minus 24. Okay, so it's been about two minutes, and the interior is now up to plus seven. Still my energy from the home as it's warming up here. And there's a low of minus 39 coming tonight. And we'll go back to Tesla. Oh, no, the four minutes got plus 20. That's perfect. We can go for a drive now. Okay, so it's so cold out that while I was filming, my iPhone shut down. The battery completely gave up. I have it now sitting on the charger inside the Tesla. So the car is warm. I'm warm. It's actually quite comfortable. The question about starting is all you do when you get in the car is you put your foot on the brake and you put it in the drive. And then you just start driving. So I think, I think that really illustrates well uh, how well these work. Um, I just wanted to note that in this video, Josh didn't have his car plugged in. Uh, he, he, at, this, at the time when he filmed this video, he didn't have access to a garage. So he kept his car outside, but he did keep it plugged in and it was able to heat up in that, in that four minutes. If his car wasn't plugged in, it would only take about 10 minutes to heat up, in my experience. So, uh, you know, you don't have to have your car plugged in uh, in the winter, but uh, to charge it, you, you should definitely have a, two, a 240 volt plug. And we'll talk about uh, charging in a moment here. Uh, but for now, I think Bill's going to take over here. We're going to talk about uh, the cost of electric vehicles. So, recently, uh, a few years ago, not so very, not so long ago, uh, the starting price was 37500 and um, it's about $15,000 more. It's a pretty basic uh, vehicle. Um, then again, it's about $15,000 more than a, than a gas car of the same class. Um, but you can take off that $5,000 rebate uh, for a new battery electric vehicle if the price is less than $5,000. And the, um, 
It applies to the, this $5,000 federal rebate also applies to battery electric vehicles as long as uh, uh, the trucks and trucks and vans are less than $60,000. Um, the um, battery packs uh, cost about um, uh, $135 per kilowatt hour and it's expected that that'll drop to So here's a, here's a graph showing the, uh, the decline in prices uh, of, uh, mm -hmm. of batteries over time. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, so you can see that it's, uh, it's a typical uh, development curve. That, uh, and, uh, but it'll flatten out, and, uh, and so we're perhaps approaching that now. Yeah, originally when I made this presentation, Bloomberg had put together uh, a nice graph that showed how it was expected to approach that $100 per kilowatt hour. Uh, you know, in 2024, but because of uh, a few different factors, you know, the pandemic, uh, the war in Ukraine, um, you know, issues with with uh, supply chains and stuff, that's why we've kind of we've kind of plateaued at this $134 mark. But you know, hopefully over time, um, as as more lithium goes to production and we're able to source out, um, you know, more more nickel and and, and whatnot, uh, these prices decrease. Um, so, you know, maintenance uh, is one of the really big savings, uh, of course, of the fuel costs. And here's, here's a nice little diagram. I believe this was, uh, this is a year in American dollars here. Uh, but this is someone's average uh, total uh, maintenance cost over about four years for a Tesla. They're putting in about $1,000. And, and my experience has been very similar to that. Really, all I'm doing is buying, uh, you know, winter tires or, or new summer tires when they wear out. They do have a little bit of extra power, so sometimes if you have a heavy foot, it'll go through the tires a little bit quicker. <laughs> um, now, charging costs, um, you know, this is a question I get all the time. How much does it cost to charge? What, how much is my power bill going to go up, right? And that's important because if you're factoring in your gas savings, there's still some extra cost from charging. Um, so if you're charging uh, on, on a level three charger, so that would be a charger on, on the road, one of the faster chargers, you're usually spending about a hundred to sorry about ten to thirty dollars for a range of about four hundred kilometers, depending on the type of charger you're at. If you're at a Tesla charger or a Shell charger, prices vary a little bit. At home, uh, the cost is much less. Uh, it would be about uh, if, about two point four cents a kilometer, right? Okay, so that's uh, what is that about twenty four cents for ten kilometers, or about two dollars and forty cents for hundred kilometers, right? So that's very very cost effective. What I tell most people is if you drive an average of 15,000 kilometers per year, you're going to be paying about $30 a month for electricity to charge your electric vehicle compared to like, uh, I think uh, $140 is what I calculated for a Honda Civic, which is a very fuel efficient vehicle, right? So you can see the difference is quite drastic. Um, and of course, if you have a truck or you have a, a sports car, I mean, you're going to be saving a lot more, right? Um, Another question we get a lot is, okay, well, how long does the battery last? Because, of course, if you have to replace it after only a few years, that could be very expensive. Um, the good news is, uh, these batteries can last up to half a million kilometers or more. I know of multiple vehicles in Canada that have been driven in winter that uh, are approaching this mark. Um, this is an example of a Model S in Germany that's actually hit one million kilometers. He's, uh, this was an image from uh, a few years ago. He's actually at about 1.2 million kilometers now. He is on his second battery, but that means that his uh, first battery has lasted at least you know, 600,000 kilometers. Um, and th that's, that often outlives the, the life of the vehicle, right? Most people are going to replace their car at that point. Um, the warranties are also you know, relatively good. Chevy Bolt has an eight year, 160,000 kilometer warranty. Uh, Model 3 long range has almost a 200,000 kilometer or an eight year warranty in the battery. Um, and if, if something catastrophic happens, if you get into a, an accident or you hit a rock or or you, you, know, you submerse your car in a, in a lake, insurance will often cover the replacement cost of your battery. And I know that because I had to do that this last summer because I drove through a small lake during a flood and uh, I incurred some damage. Uh, that wasn't supposed to happen. Um, the batteries are supposed to be sealed, but it was a, a bit of a hectic situation and, and SGI did cover the cost of my battery. So, uh, so if you're worried about battery replacement costs, uh, you know, this should hopefully ease your mind a little bit. Now we're going to talk about how to actually charge the car. So there are uh, several different types of chargers that are available for 
for uh, most cars, um, every electric vehicle will come with a 120 volt uh, level one charger that you can plug into uh, a typical 15 amp uh, outlet like this. And, but it's, it's uh, typically not very practical for most applications of cars. Um, and because it will only have about eight kilometers of range per hour of charging. A level two charger plugs into uh, a 240 volt outlet where you can hardwire it. And, and, and they typically will add uh, 30 kilometers or 30 to 70 kilometers uh, per hour of charging. Uh, so these are much more practical and most people who um, buy an electric vehicle will end up um, getting one of these for their house, houses. Um, and uh, you know, it's also the kind of uh, charging that is available to you at destination charging locations like hotels if you're on the road trip. This is an example of one here. Um, that's what it looks like. It's a pretty small thing, and uh, it takes about the same energy as, um, as your stove or a dryer. Uh, and I guess there's another image there. Uh, and then there are level three or DC fast chargers that are the typical chargers that you'll see uh, and use on, on road trips. And this is an example of a, of a Tesla uh, DC fast charger. And so they will add uh, in the order of uh, 400 kilometers uh, in 200 in the case of, of a Tesla fast charger, and um, uh, those, those uh, rates of charge are, are increasing um, uh, every year with uh, you know, leading models, but uh, some of them have, have less than that. But 400 kilometers in 20 minutes is what a, a typical uh, Tesla will, uh, will charge at in, uh, in one of these chargers. Here's, here's an image of, uh, from PubShare which shows the locations of publicly available level two chargers. And so you can see it's, it's uh, they're, they're plenty full. Um, and, and even in Saskatoon, um, there's uh, quite a density of these. Um, some of these are car dealerships and others are businesses that, uh, that want to encourage uh, people to come there and charge their electric vehicles. Level three chargers, uh, uh, which are the DC fast chargers we were just referring to. Here's, uh, this is an image from share also, and it's showing the level three chargers for vehicles that are non-Tesla. So um, there, the uh, CCS is the typical uh, charging uh, protocol for uh, the Chevy Bolt and a few others. Uh, Chatmo is the charging protocol for the Nissan vehicles. And this is, uh, these are the uh, EV chargers for uh, yeah, I mean, uh, so this is yeah, just another map of the, the Tesla specific chargers. You can see that we have some chargers in Yorkton and Winter that are going to be coming online right away. So really, we've got pretty good coverage in Saskatchewan. When I first bought my car, none of these chargers existed. Uh, and so when I had to bring it home from Calgary, now there's a, a store in, in Saskatoon, I had, to, I had to charge up those level two chargers. And it took me and my wife uh, uh, about, I don't know, what was it now, 12 hours to get from Edmonton. Um, and, and now we just made that trip this last weekend for a wedding and I think it took us maybe six hours, right? Because we have these chargers now. Um, so that just goes to show you how, uh, how important the charging infrastructure is um, in, in Saskatchewan. Um, we, we've done trips, in 2018 we did a trip down within, we went to Palm Springs actually, and uh, once you get out of Saskatchewan it was fine, but getting out was the, was the big hurdle. Now we don't have that, it's very easy to, to get to the number one highway and, and you're on your way. Um, just going to talk about uh, safety uh, of EVs. This is a question that we get a lot as well. You know, how, how safe are these vehicles? Uh, there's a lot of rumors about you know uh, the battery exploding. You could get in a car accident and whatnot. Um, and so, first of all, in a, in a crash, uh, these are some of the safest vehicles uh, in production today. Uh, the Model Three has the lowest probability of injury in a collision of any vehicle tested by the NHS, NHTSA, and that's over 900 cars they've tested. Um, it's also won the IHS Top Safety Pick Award. Uh, the Audi e-tron also won that same award. Um, and recently, the Tesla Model Y was designated as the safest automobile tested in Europe by Euro MCAT. Um, so uh, David Zuby, the Chief Research Officer at IHS, says if you, uh, you don't need to trade away safety if you want to choose an electric vehicle. Um, and I want to actually show you a quick test video here that really shows that. Um, sorry, those... <coughs> Um, 
so before I play this video, I just want to give you a bit of a background here. So this is a Model X uh, made by Tesla. This is their full-scale, full-size SUV. Uh, this Tesla was from quite a few years ago, maybe 2016 or 2017. And what you're going to see here is that the vehicle, this is a rollover test. The vehicle is going to come in from the, from the right side. It's going to hit the sand they have on a table, and it's going to basically it test how, uh, how resistant the vehicle is to, to rolling. And what you're going to see is because this battery, which weighs about a thousand pounds, is on the bottom of the car, it helps to kind of keep that car from turning all the way over. And so they're going to do three tests at different speeds, and you'll see at the third test something very interesting happens. So there's the first one, and the second. Just about tips, and the third one is, is where they really won the award here. So you can see it almost goes over, and then it comes back because of the weight of that battery, and that's never happened with any other vehicle. Um, so for an SUVs especially, the rollover resistance is, is very high. It's very safe in, in that aspect. Um, so, you know, in general, uh, you know, they're in, in an accident, uh, electric vehicles are probably the safest vehicle you can, you can drive. So, um, the criticism that is often leveled at electric vehicles in Saskatchewan is, well, aren't they powered by coal? And the answer is, well, yes, but they use that energy very efficiently. And so these are images of um, SAS Power's uh, generating capacity. On the left is, is the uh, capacity in uh, 2020, 2020 to 2021, which shows about 8% of the generating capacity from uh, natural gas and coal. On the right is the forecasted um, generating capacity um, for, uh, in, in five years. And, and so there, the, the, uh, uh, it's down to about 61%, the, uh, the fossil fuel generated uh, electricity, and, uh, and a balance from, uh, from hydro and, and wind and solar. Here's another image of, um, the, uh, of the, where the coal generation is in Canada. Um, in uh, the far left is uh, 2004, and where there's a deep, there's, there's a deep uh, dive in Alberta and Alberta's um, coal consumption for electricity and by 2030 it will be, it'll be phased out in, uh, in most provinces except for Nova Scotia. Mm -hmm. um, of course, you know, charging from the grid isn't the only option. Uh, as Bill is very familiar with uh, through the solar business, um, you can also charge with the sun. Um, on our first uh, road trip, out, uh, we, we came through Medicine Hat, and at the community college, they had a bunch of solar panels set up. They also had a wind turbine. I think they've since taken it down. Uh, this was a bit of an, an experiment, and they had some EV chargers. And so uh, at that moment, we, we charged from the sun, and of course, that had essentially zero emissions, other than the emissions to you know manufacture the, the solar panels. So uh, we have a lot of people in our club, and a lot of people in Saskatoon and Canada that. Uh, that have utilized solar panels to charge their vehicle exclusively. Um, an important part of, uh, of utilizing solar energy is, of course, storing that power uh, when, you know, when you don't have the sun, right? If it's cloudy or if it's at night. Uh, and Tesla utilizes their battery system in what's called a Tesla power wall. Uh, typically, a house could use about two or three or four of these, and you're able to use it as backup or to charge your vehicle uh, should there be a power outage. Uh, or at night when the, when the sun's not shining. Uh, I have some friends in Regina that have the system and it's very useful. In California, there's been, you may have heard in the news, there's been some power outages or some rolling blackouts. And what Tesla's done is they've, they've linked their network of, of these uh, battery walls together as a bit of a, an experiment. Uh, it's, the, it's volunteers, so the, the people that own these power walls can opt into this program. And should there be a need, um, in the event of a, a, a rolling blackout, they can actually put power back into the grid to help other people that don't have this. And they did this this year for the first time and it worked very, very well. They basically created a small scale uh, power grid, uh, which is incredible. Uh, a lot of people have concerns about if we all go electric, what's gonna happen to the grid? If we introduce storage in that as well, there's actually some benefits. There are some electric vehicles on the market today, such as the Ford uh, F-150, that can actually utilize the battery in the vehicle 
to charge or to, to um, power the house or uh, other you know other uh, sources on the grid. So there's there's a whole system here that, that we can utilize. Um, specifically in Saskatchewan, you know how how efficient are EVs? If you go and buy an EV today, how much are you reducing your emissions? Um, this is a, a chart that was put together by Sats Power, and you can see here the different types of EVs. Uh, we can get up to about 40 to 50 percent reduction in our emissions from driving an EV in our province with the energy that we have currently. As the time goes on, as you saw in that one graph, as coal gets phased out, as things get cleaner, we can approach 74% reduction in, in emissions by switching to EVs in Saskatchewan. Um, you know, if you look at a gas car, their motors are only maybe 12 to 30% efficient at, at converting that chemical energy in the gasoline into that, that kinetic energy to actually make it move. A lot of it's wasted for heat, or, uh, as heat. EVs are over 77% efficient. When you, when you account for, for generation and, and line losses and, and charging losses. So there's a huge difference right off the bat, just in, in, the, in energy efficiency, plus EVs as they slow down, those electric motors actually recharge the battery, right? So when you're braking, you're, you're regenerating energy. Uh, a natural gas turbine has a net thermal efficiency of 60%, right? So even if you're using fossil fuel to charge your vehicle, it's still way more efficient, right, than, than burning gas in a car. Um, a lot of people ask, okay, well, what about the manufacturing emissions? And, that, and that's an important thing to talk about. You know, it's not, it, there, there are environmental impacts of manufacturing these, these batteries. And so there was a study done in 2018 by uh, an organization called the Two Degrees Institute. And they kind of mapped out North America, or part of North America, and showed for each region, based on their local electricity generation type, how many kilometers would a person have to drive their EV to offset those manufacturing emissions? Uh, and in Saskatchewan, you can see it's only about 28,000 kilometers. So I've got uh, almost got 100,000 kilometers on my car, so I've surpassed that now threefold. Um, in, in areas that have cleaner energy, you know, in BC, well, they're only like just above 11,000 because they have so much hydro, right? Um, so, so people often ask, yeah, is it, is it really cleaner? Absolutely. Um, Another another issue or another question that I, I get from people is, you know, what about what about cobalt and, and lithium mining? What about battery fires? Um, there's not that much cobalt in these batteries, and that amount is decreasing rapidly. Of course, the concern with cobalt is unethical mining uh, in the in the in the Congo. There's a there's a lot of cobalt there, but unfortunately, there's some ethical concerns. Um, and uh, and so there are some companies like BYD that have gone completely cobalt free. The new Tesla 4680 cells, which are manufactured in Texas right now, don't use any cobalt. Um, so really that's not so much of a concern now as it, as it was before. Um, but of course it's important that these, that these components are, are sourced ethically. Um, the amount of lithium that's in a battery is only about two or three kilograms per kilowatt. So there might be about uh, you know, uh, 100, 100 kilograms in a, in a standard EV battery, uh, and that's mined once, right? Uh, whereas with a, a gas vehicle, you, you have to continually drill and refine oil and burn it over the life of the vehicle. Um, then here's just a little graph of the kind of chemistry and, and the usage of different types of materials. Uh, this is specifically for, I believe, for cobalt. So you can see that the demand here has really, has really shifted down over the few, last few years. Um, is a quote from Tesla, basically just saying, you know, they're really committed to making sure that they're sourcing battery, uh, uh, battery materials ethically. Um, and, uh, and then here's just a quick quote about, um, about battery fires. So this is another question we get a lot. Um, you may have seen in the news some uh, electric vehicles have, have had a fire. And the, the fires are difficult to put out because it's, it's lithium and it burns hotter. Um, but the reality is, uh, even though some of the fires might be a bit worse, they happen much less. According to Tesla, the chance of an EV fire is 10 times less than the chance of a gas car fire. Uh, and to back that up, the NHTSA had a, a, a bit of a study that they did, and they have a quote here that says, the propensity and severity of fires and explosions from lithium ion battery systems are anticipated to be somewhat comparable or slightly less than those for gasoline or diesel vehicular fuels. Um, so to summarize, basically, you don't have to worry about any, any fire issues with, with your EV. 
Um, there, there were some rumors going around that you couldn't park an EV underground because they might light on fire, and that was obviously false. There's nowhere in Saskatchewan that will stop you from storing your car underground. Um, so now we're going to talk a little bit, just to kind of summarize here, or to finish our, our presentation, just to talk about the EV market uh, in Canada and Saskatchewan and, and also the community. Um, so this is just some information that I gathered from, from Stats Canada recently. This kind of shows the graph in, in Saskatchewan of, of battery electric, or sorry, of zero emission capable vehicles. Um, and you can see that, you know, 2017 there was basically done. And over the course of the last uh, five years, things have really taken off. Um, this is a very nice exponential curve. Uh, and you can see that, we, you know, in this graph in 2021, uh, in 2021 we've approached the 1,000 vehicle mark. Um, currently, I think we're above about 1,200 vehicles in, in Saskatchewan. So people are adopting these and that rate of adoption is accelerating, which is really, really exciting. It's what we want to see. Um, in Canada, uh, you know, there, there was a huge milestone that was hit in 2021. Uh, EVs uh, were, they compromised 5.2% of all new vehicles registered in Canada. In 2019 and 2020, this was only 3%. In some areas in Canada, like in Vancouver, for example, that number is approaching 15%. You know, so things are, are really uh, accelerating. Outside of Canada, in places like Norway, uh, they're at like 80% of all new vehicles are electric, and that's a, that's a cold country as well, right? So, so we know that it's possible to, to really get people excited about this and to really shift, uh, you know, shift the sales from gas to electric. Um, in the community in Saskatchewan, of course, I started the Tesla Owners Club in 2018. Uh, there are hundreds of clubs around the world in over 20 countries. We have over 100,000 members. Locally, we have just over 200. Um, and here's a little picture that we took a few years ago in Regina. Uh, when the, uh, the Tesla superchargers came online. Uh, and so we have events throughout the year, barbecues and whatnot, um, and uh, it's, it's a lot of fun, I've met a lot of great people. Um, and Bill's gonna talk about Saskia later. We have uh, uh, an electric vehicle group that's uh, based in Saskatchewan, uh, Saskatoon here, called uh, Saskia V. Uh, on Facebook we have uh, 660 some um, followers. Uh, it's, a, it's a controlled entry group, so Supportive of uh, of electric vehicles adoption, and uh, if you have any interest, um, by all means, get in touch with us. We have a website, uh, sasbv.ca, as well, and so there'll be lots of people um, available to you if you join us um, to help you with your questions. Um, here's a picture of us um, at Starbucks, or just across from Starbucks, where there's uh, a couple of chargers uh, and, a, and a union. And then in Regina, there is uh, a Saskatchewan Electric Vehicle Association. So this, uh, in a couple of weeks, or a week and a half, on October 2nd, there's, uh, from, from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m., there's uh, an event called Charged Up, um, which is Saskatoon's Electric Vehicle Expo. It's in support of, of uh, Drive Electric Week. And uh, so there'll be some uh, uh, electric vehicle uh, rides available, and you'll be able to see some, and uh, take rides in them, and, and talk to lots of uh, uh, electric vehicle owners. So um, give it some thought. Uh, it's a uh, it's free admission, I believe, mm -hmm. for, uh, for um, people who want to come. So uh, please, uh, please turn out if you have any interest in electric vehicles. Any questions? Yes. Just, but before we get going, um, I will uh, step in here and say that I'll repeat your questions just for the sake of our Facebook live stream to make sure that they are clear. So if you do have a question, raise your hand and I'll either gesture to you or maybe this light tap on your shoulder if you can't, um, if I can't get it sight line. 
So the question is, um, using a solar panel on a car to augment the electric battery. So where would you house that and how effective would that be? Yeah, I could speak to that a little bit. Um, so that's a great question, and I've thought about this a lot as well. Uh, they're, the first manufacturer to do this was a, a manufacturer called Fisker Automotive. They're, they're no longer around, or rather they've been purchased by a different brand. And they had a vehicle um, that had some solar panels on the roof. And that specific vehicle was a plug-in hybrid, so it, it had the option to use either or. And it, was, it did generate a lot of electricity. Um, it perhaps only added maybe one or two kilometers of driving per day. And that's because of the limitations of a couple things. First, you know, the amount of area that's available, and of course, uh, you know, just the energy of the sun with the efficiency that we have in our solar panels. Now, since that vehicle was made, um, we've developed EVs that are more efficient, so they don't need as much power to go as far, and we've also developed solar panels that are more efficient. There's now a company, uh, there's, actually, well, there's a few that I've seen now, but the one that comes to mind first is called Aptera. Uh, you can look them up. They make a very efficient, very aerodynamic, uh, I think it's a two-seater, kind of like a trike looking vehicle, so it's got three wheels, and they plastered it with solar panels, and they are claiming that they can drive about a thousand kilometers, and, and, and some of that is because of those solar panels. So it's, it's certainly something that's being developed in some situations, it just hasn't gone mainstream because it's, at this point, not really worth the, the extra costs. EVs are already so expensive that, that sometimes it's tough to justify a few extra kilometers of range for what could be thousands of dollars extra. What's a better option is to put those solar panels on your house, and because they're always there, it's a much larger surface, and then you can use that energy. Use that as a home charging station. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. 25 years of the game. Yes. We have a 2018 um, Prius Prime, like it's a hybrid. How sh soon should we be trading it in? So we have someone with a Prius Prime. 2018. 2018 wants to know how soon they should trade that and get another EV, I assume? Well, I think the, uh, the important thing is that uh, the next vehicle that you buy be electric. Yeah. And somebody's going to drive that uh, vehicle that you presently own until the end of its life. And so that could be you. The, the hybrid, they will use that till the end of its life? Well, it, it will have a, you know, a light that, uh, that it will go, and so maybe that's uh, 200,000 kilometers or, or whatever. Oh. But uh, the important thing is that you buy an electric vehicle next. And so um, uh, we can talk a little bit more about the, uh, you know, your specific uh, driving habits, but, uh, but that would be the, uh, the, the So how many kilometers should, should I get out of the hybrid? to buy a fully electric vehicle right now, I would do that. If you can't afford it yet, uh, then don't. Um, from an environmental perspective, uh, it, it's definitely the, 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 the better option, right? Uh, like, like we showed another slide, you know, the environmental offset for a gas car is about 27,000 kilometers. If you're coming from a plug-in hybrid, it might be maybe twice that, right? But you're still gonna see those you're going to realize those gains, right? You're going to see that efficiency happen. So, simple answer, if you can afford it, I would do it as soon as possible. Um, Plug-in hybrids are going to hold their value for a little while longer, I think. Um, but, you know, EVs are, battery electric EVs are really high in demand right now, and that's going to be like that for quite a while. So, as soon as you can get your hands on one, probably the better. So I have, I have some, some anecdotes. Um, 
some personally and some not. I, I haven't gone away for more than, than about two weeks. Um, it, it depends on the climate. If, if your car's outside and it's summer, it basically shuts down and, and will conserve a lot of its energy for a very long time. We're talking like weeks and weeks and weeks. In that situation, I would still recommend plugging it in to at least a 110 volt, just in case something happens. Um, if the car tries to update or something, you might use some of that energy. Some electric vehicles also have security options, so they all have cameras and stuff that are recording, and that'll use some power as well. But in general, a 110 should be no problem in summer. In winter, on a really, really cold day, I've heard some stories and I've, I've, I've talked to some people about issues with using a 110 plug if the battery should drain to a very low percentage and that battery get very cold. Because what happens is in order for the battery to safely charge, it has to warm up a little bit. And when you have a thousand pound mass that gets very cold, it can't do that very efficiently or very easily without a really good power source. And so there was a story of someone in Alberta that got stuck at a gas station. They had run out of electricity. They were trying to charge the car on 110 and it, went, it just wouldn't charge after like three or four days because it couldn't, it couldn't pull enough power to warm it up enough to start that charge. So in Saskatchewan, if you plan on leaving your vehicle and you're going away and it's outside, I would definitely say plug it in into a 240 volt plug. Um, if, if you have the option to keep it in a heated space, then a 110 would be fine. If even that, I mean, depending on how long how you're gone for, what kind of vehicle it is. But if you charge it to 80%, store it, keep it plugged in, like we only have a 110 in our garage, and we're retired, we don't seem to need any more than that. We've right. been doing fine with it. But, so if you charge it to 80% and plug it into a 110 for the winter when we're gone, and we don't think that's is it heated in the room? It's not heated, it's um... It's in, maybe insulated, but... It's insulated. Yeah. You, you know, you'd probably be okay. What I would recommend doing is is having someone just keep an eye on, well, what kind of vehicle do you have again, a Kona? Do you have um, uh, mobile access, like through a, an application on your phone? Uh, yeah, we have that Bluetooth. Okay. Yeah. So what I would do is just keep an eye on it, and, you know, just because I, you'd hate for it to, for some reason, lose charge, and then you know damage the battery, right? Because if, if you lose charge and, and, it's, and it freezes, you can damage the battery, and, and that, that can cause some problems. So just keep an eye on it, and uh, and if something happens, maybe call a friend and, and they can take it over to a, a charger for you. But I would say that in in an unheated garage that's insulated, if you kept it plugged at eighty percent, I think you'd be okay. Um, but keep an eye on it. Does that kind of answer your question? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's a hard question. <laughs> A lot of variables there. So. Yes. <laughs> uh, okay. Any other questions? Yes, catch up. Uh, yeah. uh, question about the, oh, you said the maintenance costs are not very high, uh, but how about repairs? Because based on consumer reports, uh, in January of this year, uh, they found the electric vehicles are much less reliable than gas vehicles. <laughs> Uh, I guess it varies from model to model, but uh, overall, how much you personally have to repair your car? And, uh, do we have uh, enough uh, older services here in Saskatoon to do that? So the question is um, the ongoing costs of going in. Um, repairs and the outright cost of it is one thing, but can you maintain it over the years? So, um, the U.S. Uh, Department of Energy has uh, done life cycle costs of maintenance of electric vehicles and compared them to gas and diesel and found that the, the electric is 60% over the lifetime of the vehicle. So it doesn't include the energy put into it. That's just maintenance for all reasons. Failures, um, regular maintenance like tires and mutual uh, lockers and things like that. So, yes, the individual uh, repairs sometimes same order of magnitude. So it's very infrequent that that is necessary. There's also very good warranties on uh, electric vehicles for the electric drive uh, You know, typically eight years or 160,000 kilometers or more. And 
and so and that's that's they did that in order to have parity with the uh, the gas and diesel powered vehicles, so that uh, people will be comfortable with that they're going to last for you know two hundred thousand kilometers or or more. So. So I, the study you mentioned the the consumer report study that said that EVs were less reliable, right? If I recall correctly. Um, and you should take a moment to, to do some of your own research because I, I, I could be thinking of a different report, but I believe that this report, um, the, one of the reasons why they deemed electric vehicles to be less reliable, or, or I think it was actually had, had more issues, um, was because there was a lot of issues that, that arose um, with, with certain things that, that were fixed with over-the-air updates. So it was a lot of more software issues and not things where you actually had to bring your vehicle in to pay somebody a fix, uh, is, is what I understand that report to, to really kind of, uh, that, that's how they came to that conclusion. Um, the amount spent repairing electric vehicles is much lower than a gas vehicle. The, the amount of specific little issues you might have could be higher, especially right now because these vehicles are they're new technology, right? So there's little glitches and bugs. Yeah, I think this was the main reason it, that, that okay. the technology is quite new and uh, not well tested. And, yeah. Uh, and, lots and, of electronics. And that's, I, I would say that's a, a good point. You know, this, when, I, when I own my vehicle, I encountered a lot of odd little issues throughout ownership, but none of those issues cost me any money. And very rarely did they cause any downtime. Um, service for Teslas is provided locally by the Tesla Service Center. Uh, and they will actually come to your house or to your office and work on your car while you're you know, sleeping or whatever, working. Uh, it, it's only in, in the event there's a very large repair you actually have to take it in. Um, and any of those little bugs that you mentioned, they're usually covered by warranty. Um, or if the car's out of warranty, oftentimes those little bugs will get fixed on the next software update. It's kind of like when you think about your cell phone, right? Um, in the early days of having a cell phone, there's lots of little bugs, but over time, you get an update and it might fix a few things, right? There's always those bug fixes. And so that's kind of what these EVs are like. They're more of a, a software sort of issue, not so much a hardware problem. Because the hardware is so simple, right? It's a battery, uh, an inverter, and a, and a motor, right? Um, of course, you still have the steering components and the suspension and stuff, but most of it's the, the technology, the software, does that answer your question a bit? Yes. Thank yeah. you. And, and the other dealers, you know, Chevrolet, Ford, Nissan, they're also qualified to work on their electric vehicles as well, the ones that they sell, right? So, so there are, are means of fixing and, and maintaining the vehicles here, but at the end of the day, a lot of those things that need to be fixed, it's just software stuff, which is, which is nice. The example of the uh, simplicity of electric vehicles is that um, there's a gear reduction uh, from the motor to the wheels, but there's no, there's no, uh, Just said that some countries such as Norway, like the the demand or the people who are actually driving electrical vehicles, like about eighty percent, compared to maybe in Canada probably it's less. How would you attribute that? What would you attribute that? Oh. Is that demand? Is the demand for electrical vehicles higher there, and why? Yeah, okay, so the, the question was, um, you know, why does Norway have such a higher adoption rate of electric vehicles than we do in Canada? Is that, is that yeah. right? Yeah, basically. Um, and, and just to repeat this, the stat, in, in Canada, the new vehicle adoption rate is about 5%. In Norway, I think it's well over 80% of new vehicles. So it's not all the vehicles that are in existence there, it's just the new ones that are being sold. I've, I've done a little bit of research into this because I was curious, you know, um, why why is it it's so much higher there? And there's a, it really comes down to uh, government policy. The the benefits and the incentives that they have in Norway are are very vast, and they're actually starting to roll them back now because they've achieved that eighty percent. Mm -hmm. But originally, I mean, they had things like free parking. You didn't have to pay taxes when you bought the vehicle. Uh, you there there were really good rebates, so they would supplement some of the cost of the vehicle. 
um, they would have uh, access to certain uh, certain lanes, so like high occupant vehicle lanes. We see that a lot in California and, and also in BC, where you can drive in the carpool lane, for example. Um, I believe they also, I don't know if this is Norway, but there was a country that introduced a law where electric vehicles could drive faster because, oh. because they didn't admit, they admit as much and because they were safer. Um, so they had a, I, there's a whole bunch more of these benefits. In places like Vancouver, where the adoption rate is 15%, so that's three times the national average, it's because they have those kinds of incentives, like the HOV lane, they have another uh, 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 subsidy that, that tops up the federal subsidy of 5,000, right? So, so they're cheaper to purchase there. Um, I don't know if they have other perks, but you can see in the provinces alone, the provinces that have their own provincial incentives have a way higher adoption rate than the provinces that don't. Mm -hmm. So, does that answer your question? Yeah, thanks. Yeah. What would you want from behind me? Okay, uh, so I guess one of the things I've heard, I'd be interested if this is true or not, but I've heard that both new and used electric vehicles are hard to come by, they're kind of high in demand. My secondary question to that is, if someone had an electric vehicle who was leaving the country for a year and wanted someone to try on that vehicle, uh, how would they go about sort of finding that audience? So there might be a hidden agenda in this question. <laughs> um, so the market for second hand and new, and new EV vehicles, and how do you go about finding a new owner for new EVs? Not a new owner. Sorry, just a, a loaner for a year. So yes, there's there's a backlog of um, electric vehicles as there has been for for many new uh, vehicles that are coming in, um, and so that's um, there are um, significant plans by manufacturers who are not yet making uh, uh, electric vehicles to to increase a lot of them. So I, I think there's going to be some relief. So, uh, but I don't, I don't think that uh, the demand for electric vehicles is going to go down and supplies are going to go up. So to your question about uh, what to do about uh, uh, your vehicle, I think it's a great idea to, to try and find somebody to, uh, to drive it instead of uh, presumably a gas vehicle that you might otherwise do. The thing that you would have to be careful about though is, uh, uh, is the insurance, who, who, who actually, whose insurance uh, So if you, if you went up to this, the group on uh, the Saskatoon group, for example, which is based here, uh, you've got an audience of 667 people who are curious to some extent, and you know, some portion 
so that vehicle would have to sit in the sun in the full sun for 16 hours to charge that battery from zero to full, full sun. And in the summer here, we have another five or six hours of full sun, so 10 days. So that's the kind of um, number that you have to think about the, the energy absorption by a small uh, surface area um, in creating electricity is, is quite small compared to the roof space on a, on a moving vehicle. And that's why Todd just said, we got to put that investment into a um, place that's stationary um, and uh, you, can, you can do far more, generate far more energy with less money. Should 